right, all right, all right. All right, great. Hi, everyone. My name is Ian McLaughlin, and I am wrapping up my PhD at the University of Pennsylvania in neuroscience. Um, and if you happen to have noticed, I was absent last week, and um, that was because I was focused on revisions to my dissertation that my committee suggested I make before graduating. And uh, the suggestions were fairly succinct, um, though one of them was to include a section on the relationships between serotonin signaling and anxiety. And while I probably could have um, kept that section to just about 10 pages, the problem is though that I have this bad habit of going way too deep on a topic when I find um, interesting threads of research. And by the way, we typically refer to different bodies of research, like all of the research that's been published in peer reviewed journals in the past that's related to like, you know, for example, how cannabis affects the brain as literature. Um, so if you ever hear a scientist say something like um, it hasn't been reported in the literature, they're basically just saying that there's no evidence present in peer-reviewed journals. Um, and I'm just mentioning it just because I know that can get a little strange sometimes. Um, anyways, um, so I have this bad habit of going way too deep when I find an interesting thread in the literature. And um, I kind of suspect that the member of my committee who suggested that I include this section um, might have expected that that was going to happen. And I should mention that when I say committee, I'm basically referring to a group of about five scientists in the same field or in related fields who basically mentor a PhD student through their primary thesis research. And uh, they're typically senior scientists who are professors at um, the PhD's institution. And then my PhD program requires that you also have one additional member from a completely unrelated institution. Um, and I'm fortunate to have a particularly accomplished scientist fulfilling that second role. Um, in fact, he was among the first scientists to characterize serotonin signaling in specific brain regions using a method that I ended up using in my project that enables us to um, measure how the, the, the changes in the amounts of a given neurotransmitter, serotonin in my case, um, how those changes occur after various treatments like, you know, treatment like exposure to drugs or being exposed to things like stressful environments um, or, or like, you know, potential mates, right? Changes in the environment. And so, you know, maybe at some time, I'll, at some point, I'll get into the details of my thesis and, and this particular section, uh, but the details are kind of granular and probably a little bit boring for most people. But suffice it to say that it involved engineering viruses and controlling the activities of specific neurons in a very specific brain region to try and map out the function of specific circuits within the brain and how those circuits may or may not influence serotonin concentrations elsewhere in the brain. And so anyways, I'm lucky to be at a great institution, and so my committee has some really heavy hitters in, in science on it. And uh, it can be rough in some ways because, you know, they are highly accomplished scientists, and so um, they can expect quite a bit from a PhD student. But anyways, that member of my committee who contributed that pioneering, pioneering work in characterizing how um, serotonin operates within the brain suggested that I add this section about the relationship between anxiety and serotonin. And um, as I said before, I kind of suspect that he anticipated that I would go, that I'd do just what I did, uh, which was go down this very, very deep rabbit hole of the literature. And so I ended up writing what likely could have just been, what probably could have been an entire additional chapter of my thesis if I didn't end, uh, end up exercising some restraint. And, you know, I say that he likely anticipated this because it was some of his own literature that helped to sort of dig this rather deep uh, rabbit hole. And so... Um, so this resulted in me spending quite a bit more time composing these various sections um, for the rest of my uh, 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 for the rest of, of my thesis, and so I've been in a kind of like writing cave for like three weeks. And because I have a little ten month old daughter who you know happens to have an insatiable curiosity and never stops moving, I ended up having to keep a kind of nocturnal schedule to be able to get more than like fifteen minutes straight of uninterrupted writing. And by the way, the baby's now sick which is unfortunate the second time she's been sick. Um, she's doing okay, but yeah, it's, it's always kind of sad. <laughs> and so, um, you know, just a few years ago, by the way, I'd have been able to bounce back in like two days after, you know, pulling several all-nighters essentially, but uh, nowadays it turns out that it takes quite a bit more time to recover. And so uh, that's why I've been absent for, for a few weeks. Um, and uh, you'll have to forgive me if I'm a little delirious at times. And so anyways, I just thought I'd show that little window into the terminal phases of a PhD in neuroscience. And so, okay, um, on to the topic. So um, a study was done at the University of Texas that evaluated the, the, the evidence that exists today that speaks to whether playing video games does or does not contribute to increased violent behavior later on in life. And so if you're anything like me, 
or if you're as old as I am, you probably are reflexively thinking, like, this is an answered question. And, you know, we know that they do not have that effect on people. And, you know, by the way, as somebody who played video games when I was younger and only recently started playing, like, sort of dipped my toes back in before I dove, back, dove into writing my dissertation, I am a member of that uh, anecdotal evidence or anecdata data that video games don't, in fact, increase a person's propensity towards violence. Um, but as we all know, anecdotal evidence is among the weakest forms of evidence. And that doesn't mean it's meaningless or, or useless, just that you don't want to, like, announce a new treatment for cancer based off of anecdata or anecdotal evidence because it tends to be the least likely to predict the most likely ways by which people will respond to a given treatment. And just to you know, further defend anecdotal evidence, um, because I think it gets a rap, bad rap, oftentimes deservedly so, but not always, scientists often rely upon anecdotal evidence to help guide our attention to which questions we end up asking and for which we end up collecting higher quality evidence during experimentation. So there, there are reasons to be skeptical of any association between video games and violence. Um, it's of course, you know, Despite that skepticism, it's important to be amenable to altering our perspectives on issues like these in response to evidence of higher quality. And so, um, fortunately, this study that was just conducted at the University of Texas is the kind of study on which we can base a bit more confidence than just our personal experiences or specific studies. Um, so uh, this study isn't the kind of study that people like I conduct. Instead, it draws from evidence that was collected during what are called longitudinal studies. And so a longitudinal study, you know, the hint is sort of in the name long, uh, is when researchers observe a given sample of a population, usually people, of, of course, not always, but usually, um, by collecting changes in variables that occur over a, usually a, a very long period of time. And, um, you know, other longitudinal studies will observe how um, a given sample of people respond to a specific treatment over time, like, like you know, how treatment with, uh, or how a diet rich in omega-3 fatty acids or like nicotinamide riboside may or may not influence the health outcomes um, of people over the course of like 30 years. Um, and so, you know, the, the point that I'm laboring, belaboring, is that um, the study takes, you know, place over time and it can be either observational, where you're just watching how a given population evolves over time, or interventional, where we're interested in the long-term treatments of, uh, or long-term effects of a given drug or, or diet or, or, or so on. And so this study that, again, was done at the University of Texas, uh, draws from the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent to Adult Health. And so it began in 1994, um, according to a priority that was um, uh, uh, mandated essentially by the Congress to study adolescent health. And so, yeah, so it started in 1994 with about 20,000 teens, which is pretty massive for you know, such a long longitudinal study. And, it, and so as a result, it's the largest lo um, study of its kind that's ever been conducted. And it's basically just a set of questionnaires, right? It's tough to do a particularly complicated longitudinal study because you're, you know, the, the goal here is to track the same person over many, many years. And, um, and so, they, they, but they also collected some biological samples like saliva samples, and I think urine samples too. Um, and the way the study has been conducted is in waves, right? And so the waves occurred every few years, starting again in 1994, but then in 1996, then 2001, then 2008. And there is a current wave um, of observation that's been occurring since 2016. Um, okay, so that's the well of data from which Michael Ward, um, who is the PhD, who, the PhD who conducted the study at the University of Texas at Arlington, by the way, um, that's the well of data from which he drew to conduct this study. And so, you know, I think it's helpful. I, I think a lot of this conversation revolves around intu intuition. Um, and so, you know, I think it's helpful to think about whether there's any actual scientific rationale or reason to suspect that video games might play some role in increased violent behavior. And so one concept is the general aggression model, which suggests that because violent uh, video games, um, the images in violent, in violent video games can be shocking um, objectively, they you know, elicit strong reactions in people initially. And so by playing video games, one learns that um, violent responses in, in the context of a game will tend to advance one's goals within the context of the game, right? You have to engage in violent behavior to advance in, in the game. And so, you know, the sort of like active ingredient of this model, uh, which, you know, I, I should add, has not been proven. 
um, is that is that the, the rationale is that this transfers from experience of playing games into the real world. And this is the model that people are likely intuitively invoking when they suggest that people, the supposed victims of the effects of video games, are no longer capable of, in, of distinguishing fiction from reality. And so another concept um, that's sort of a subset of the general aggression model is desensitization theory. Um, which is sort of, you know, again, like a variant uh, of the GAM, uh, general aggression model, which um, suggests that long-term exposure to any given stimulus, by the way, it doesn't have to be video games, um, but violent imagery in video games in this case, causes people to lose those initial reactions of, you know, repulsion or, or recoil. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, it's probably obvious here, but the active ingredient of this model is that given this desensitization, it becomes easier for a person to be gauged, to engage in behaviors uh, that would otherwise be repulsive to them uh, had they not been desensitized by exposure to, to video games. And so, you know, at the root of this is the learning that occurs when a person recognizes that their initial repulsion to a given stimulus or, you know, violent imagery in this case, um, proves to be completely unnecessary and even maladaptive in the context of a game, right? It, it's maladaptive to find this image, this imagery prohibitively repulsive to engage, right? Because you'll lose the game <laughs> if, if that's your reaction every time. And so desensitization, you know, so desensitization, the concept is at the root of other psychological dynamics. It's not, it's not only talked about in the context of um, video games. Like, you know, for example, people with debilitating phobias can undergo therapies to minimize or eliminate their phobic reactions. And the only way that these treatments are able to work is via desensitization. Um, and so it's, um, you know, it's worth noting that, that the, that first model, the general aggression model is composed of other kind of, uh, theoretical models, uh, with names that are probably kind of arcane to a lot of people like cognitive neo association, script theory, and excitation, uh, transfer. And Ward does a good job of noting that there are, are critics of the general aggression model um, that you know, they, the critics basically highlight that this model is like all encompassing and lacking a foundational support. And to be a little bit more specific, most um, like essentially all acts of aggression would be able to be explained by something like a general aggression model. And so, you know, the critics will argue that falsification of this model, which is important to any useful progress in science, we always have to have um, falsifiability, is impossible, right? If every behavior falls under this model, then how can we possibly falsify this model um, or, or try to falsify it? Um, and so, you know, these two models are not particularly nuanced or, or complicated really at, at, their, at the crux, but I suspect they're, they're probably pretty intuitive to most people, particularly folks who haven't been playing video games for very long, like boomers, for example, as the cool kids say. Uh, but, you know, Ward makes a good point that video games are just one of many rather new forms of digital media that may or may not have relevance to violent behavior, violent acts. And so for me, it's like it's it's hard to contemplate that the Internet in its modern incarnation, not like the early, like kind of simple Internet, uh, has really only existed for like less than a person's lifespan. And like Google, Google itself uh, in its earliest incarnation before it was like the Mac daddy of search engines began just before the millennium in YouTube, almost most of a decade later, um, along with the earliest versions of Facebook and Twitter. Um, and so, you know, it feels I think these things feel like such integral parts of our daily lives. These things really haven't existed for very long, far too short of a time for us to really understand how our minds are adapting to its prevalence. And so um, Ward notes that these forms of technology have been adopted because they've basically become indispensable in less than a decade. Um, and a uh, few could have foreseen the benefits of them before they were manifest. And because of this, as of yet short lifespan, only a handful of studies and fewer still studies of high, of high quality have been conducted that can help us to understand our cognitive and behavioral relationships with these technologies. And then Ward makes one uh, 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 final good point, which is, well, he makes several good points. One final point that I'll mention is that violence in entertainment media has existed for centuries, right? And particularly the glorification of war, uh, particularly early on, but also in like comic books, uh, you know, with a sensory delivery system that's quite a bit more vivid and, and arguably evocative than like reading Gilgamesh or, or Beowulf or even the, the Bible. Um, 
and you know has been the case with video games there's always been some concern over the effects of violence in media in the united states um but psychologists have taken a particular interest in video games and you know there there have been several meta studies which is a kind of analysis of a large collection of research um that you know, they had collected about 100 empirical studies, which is like little specific studies, um, into the psychological effects of violent video games since just 2015. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a hot topic. Um, and, and it seems to be uniquely hot uh, with regards to video games relative to other forms of media. Um, and, you know, Ward also notes that while a positive association between playing video games and violence does exist, it doesn't appear to be causal. Okay, so we're getting into the actual findings now. Um, and so, in other words, while people that play video games also tend to engage in violent behavior, there's no reason to believe that it's the playing of video games that causes this increased predisposition. And again, this is his analysis of um, data derived from that massive, massive longitudinal study. Um, and so, as Ward himself puts it, quote, while the data show that fighting later in life is related to playing video games at a, as an adolescent, most of this is because, relative to females, males both play games more often and fight more often. And estimates that better establish causality find no effect or a small negative effect. And so, you know, to put it a little bit more bluntly, this is the most thorough study that's ever been conducted since researchers became concerned about the effects of video games on violent behavior. And this study found that video games simply cannot be said to cause violent behavior. Um, and so, you know, we tend to hear speculation that video games may explain violent tragedies, you know, that occur periodically and, and more frequently lately, it, it seems, um, that, you know, young people in particular have been enacting. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember the shooting at Columbine, uh, which basically brought the country to its knees for years. Um, it happened in 1999, by the way, before the internet had really matured into anything like what it is today, and certainly video games were far simpler uh, back then, um, and so, and obviously before social media as well. And so, you know, these days it's probably a little bit hard to believe that really anything lasts in the news cycle for longer than like a few days. But it was essentially all anyone talked about uh, for weeks and weeks and remained a major issue for much longer. Um, it was as hard as it is to understand how these more recent tragedies occur, it was even harder then. And there was this kind of struggle to figure out the culprit or at least some explanation for why it could have happened. And, you know, at the time, a lot of mistakes and misreporting was produced by that struggle. And some of those mistakes were done in absolutely good faith, um, while some of it was, and I'm, I'm speculating here, in pursuit of particular political goals. Um, but, you know, everything from, from music and Marilyn Manson in particular at the time to bullying to video games were proposed as explanations for why um, such young people could enact such wanton violence. And, you know, we've seen similar suggestions made lately um, in, Egypt, in addition to attributing the crisis um, to, uh, you know, uh, mental health. And, you know, I think that's probably a topic for another time because there's plenty of misconceptions regarding the relationships between violence and mental health. Um, but what this study shows is that there just isn't any evidentiary reason to suspect that uh, video games can explain why it is that young people have been engaging in this violent behavior um, at the frequency we've been seeing. And, you know, it may very well be the case that video games for specific people in specific contexts do indeed increase their propensity for violence, or it may be the case that we're all experiencing an elevation of exposure to violence in general, not just in video games, violence to which we have no personal exposure, it's not happening to us or even people we know, but to which we're nevertheless exposed via the news. And so when violent acts occur in distant places, which has always happened, right, over the course of human evolution, we feel closer to it now than we ever have before. Or maybe there's a kind of pseudo contagion model where a given violent behavior um, tends to result in replication by others, similar to like increased uh, frequency of suicides um, that tend to occur after a celebrity takes their own life. And so, um, you know, regardless of this and other studies suggest that there's some other explanation, combination of explanations. And unfortunately it seems that it's just not so simple as the video games young people play.
All right, that's what I have for today. So on to the live half. Um, and the girls just got back from a walk. So if you hear any lovely baby sounds, it, I'm not making, I'm not ventriloquizing them. Um, all right. Hello, everyone. My name is Ian McLaughlin, and I'm a PhD candidate in neuroscience at the University of Pennsylvania. And I just talked about a study focused on whether or not video games do or don't cause increased violence later on in life. Video games, when played by adolescents, causes does or does not cause um, increased violence later on in life over on YouTube. Um, so you can check that out if you'd like, about 15 minutes or so. Um, I also talked about where I've been for the past like two or three weeks. I've been um, going way overboard in writing, adding a, a basically almost a chapter to my dissertation focused on the relationship between anxiety and serotonin signaling. Um, so that, that's what I've been doing. And I basically had to become nocturnal uh, because it, you know I have a 10 month old daughter and she's extremely curious and she's always moving around and walking around. Um, so the YouTube channel is, I, okay, I think it's named Anthropoid. I, I don't think I can like, like identify my URL yet, but I, I'm pretty sure if you, if you search like Ian Anthropoid Brain, you can get me. Thumper, what's up? Good to see you. It's been a million years, I feel like. Is coffee good for us? Well, it kind of depends on how you define good for you. Um, so, you know. For something to be good for you, I would submit to you that it ought to enhance uh, uh, health or longevity or cognitive acuity in a way that's sustainable. Um, generally speaking, unless you are in a diseased state, drugs really don't, are not generally good for you, right? Psychoactive drugs. Now, again, if you have a disease or a disorder, that totally changes the equation here. But um, if you're an otherwise healthy person, most drugs are not going to confer benefits. So the question really isn't, is it good for you? It's how bad for you might it be, right? And you, you can weigh that against the benefits that you, uh, you know, harvest from the pharmacology of caffeine. So for example, you know, I consume plenty of caffeine. Um, but so, you know, studies have been done year after year after year, and it seems like they very frequently disagree with one another as to whether or not coffee has any negative or deleterious effects on health. And generally speaking, even the studies that identify some deleterious effect on health, they tend to be fairly minor. Um, and they tend to be things like increasing risks for osteoporosis in women after menopause, right? It's never like it causes you know, it, it, neurotoxicity or crippling addiction, right? People don't, don't engage in um, overtly risky behavior just to get their caffeine fix. Um, and caffeine does um, confer some psychoactive benefits, like, for example, making you feel like you have more energy. And it's a very interesting mechanism, by the way, if you're, if you're interested in how coffee, how caffeine makes you, gives you energy. It's, very, uh, it's a very interesting mechanism. It's very unique relative to other drugs that do kind of similar stuff. Um, it increases focus. <laughs> uh, so while I, I can't tell you that coffee is 100% benign or that it's certainly that it's good for you, I would suggest to you that on balance, among all the various things that we engage in day to day, in our day to day lives, it's among the most benign substances you can consume. Um, all right. Uh, uh, hey, Ian, have you studied anything about altitude sickness? Uh, specifically, uh, uh, okay, yeah. So, yeah, well, I've not only studied it a little bit, but um, I've actually experienced it on a fairly regular basis because my parents live in basically like adjacent to a ski town in Colorado. They live at about 10,000 feet. I live in Philadelphia where I can see the sea level. Um, and so pretty much every time I go back, I, I'm confronting uh, uh, altitude sickness. Um, and so, you know, ultimately what it is, is a period of time during which your body is readapting to a lower concentration of, al uh, of alcohol lower concentration of oxygen uh, because the air is simply thinner up there. Um, and so as a result, you're literally producing more hemoglobin, right? That, that concentration or that amount that you produce is uh, flexible. And so it, but like essentially any form of protein synthesis, whether it's in the brain or outside of the brain in the peripheral physiology, protein synthesis is an extended thing that takes time. You know, genes have to be activated or activated more. And that is an, a, a drawn out process. 
Um, and so as a result, you're sort of suffering from a kind of like low potency oxygen deprivation. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and so that's why, by the way, you might notice if you like fly into Denver or if you ever go skiing, um, which I haven't had the chance to do in a million years at this point, um, you people, they, they now sell like little oxygen pods, like little, they look like, um, we call them pony canisters in scuba diving, but just basically little portable cans of oxygen that you can huff on. Uh, and it does help a little bit, uh, but you know, it is just, it takes time. There does seem to be a genetic, um, genetic variants that may explain why it is some people respond way uh, m way more severely than others. Um, I know my wife, for some reason, has like a superpower. She's just like unaffected. You know, she, she could just like go from, you know, sea level to like 20,000 feet. And she's like, what's going on, guys? <laughs> Catch up. Keep up. Um, so, yeah. But the, the uh, granular nuances of those genetics, I uh, do not have top of mind. Um, okay, in the future, can brains be connected to the internet or something to gain more knowledge? Well, Kelmu Velho, very interesting topic, very timely topic. Um, the short answer, just to satiate your curiosity in as expeditious a manner as possible, yes. However, the longer answer is, but it's going to be a while. <laughs> and if you're interested in, in a kind of longer conversation, a longer treatment of the topic, I have a podcast called Wired to be Weird. And um, I speak with my co-host about whole brain computer interfaces and more specifically, well, we use Neuralink, which is Elon Musk's sort of new, sort of new at this point, company devoted to developing a whole brain computer interface um, as a kind of like framework. But we're really talking about just, you know, the, the viability um, and, and prospects and, you know, um, kind of forecast of what it would be like upon the inception of whole brain computer interfaces. We currently have um, brain computer interfaces. Um, and, you know, most notably for the treatment of conditions like Parkinson's disease, where you have electrodes planted deep in subcortically deep in your brain, targeting a part of the brain called the substantia nigra, which is a major source of dopamine in the brain, which deteriorates um, during the progression of Parkinson's. And those electrodes are essentially controlled by a very simple computer that will deliver um, uh, current to stimulate those neurons that are, other that are otherwise um, sort of underactive. Um, there's also um, some trials of similar approaches, similar applications of a similar technology to the treat for the treatment of things like addiction and depression. Of course, very, very severe addiction or depression treatment resistant. Um, and so, you know, it's not like we've never tried anything like this before. We do it fairly regularly. And if you want to be shocked by what the power of a brain computer interface can be, go on YouTube and look for videos of people with Parkinson's turning on and off their, their, um, their stimulators. Um, basically, you know, turning off that, the delivery of current to that substantia nigra, and you'll see just how quickly their behavior, their, you know, very um, conspicuous behavior mo changes on a, you know, in a matter of seconds, uh, less. Um, and then right when they turn it back on, it, th those tremors disappear once again. Um, Okay, but so, but, you know, so the answer was yes, but it's going to take a while. The reason it's going to take a while is that the human brain is composed of about, uh, about 86 billion neurons and hundreds of trillions of synaptic connections between them, right? Let alone the role that another type of brain cell that doesn't get quite as much attention, glial cells, which also play very important roles, but they're not firing impulses like neurons, and so they're not quite as sexy. Um, I'm a neuron guy myself, but that's me. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so to develop a computer that's going to be able to interface with the brain in a meaningful way, you're going to have to be able to interface with several million neurons at least. That One of the estimates is about 10 million or 11 million neurons simultaneously. That could very well be a, a severe underestimation of how many neurons are going to need to be interacted, uh, uh, interacting with this computer. Um, it could be that we need at least 1 billion neurons and we need, it's not going to be like, okay, we reached 1 billion neurons within this little neighborhood of the brain. They're going to have to be distributed all throughout the brain from the front to the back, from rostral to caudal, anterior to posterior. Those, all, those words all mean the same thing, front, back. <laughs> Anyways, um, and we are nowhere remotely close to being able to electrophysiologically interact with you know, 10 million neurons, let alone several hundred neurons simultaneously. And then those, you know, okay, let's say that we develop some kind of platform like Neuralink, for example, 
is moving forward with a, a system where you can essentially inject a lattice of electrodes that will spread out over a given region. And then those that lattice will communicate wirelessly with some kind of computer that will then collect all this data of the behavior of neurons. Okay, now you have all this data. The next major, major you know, milestone in neuroscience is going to be how do you manage that data? How do you deconvolute it? How do you interpret it, right? All you're getting is just, okay, this neuron was on at this point, this neuron was on at that point, what does it mean? And, um, you know, work like mine will contribute to progress towards developing a better understanding of that, of those data. Um, so, all right, does this guy answer questions? I do my best. Um, you have to give a simple answer, then go to the next question. Well, it was an interesting topic. And if you're interested in, I mean, who cares? Like, yeah, I could just say like, yes, but that, that doesn't really, it's, there's no potency. There's no nutrition to that answer. I'm all about delivering nutrition. Um, all right. Um, is the brain, is the brain's complexity, oh, proof of an intelligent creator in your opinion? Well, I would submit to you that my opinion on matters of spirituality are no more valuable to you than any other person you could talk to in a bar, right? My expertise is in understanding the brain, the spiritual, the metaphysical uh, uh, implications, ramifications of human intelligence, the complexity of the human brain. That's a conversation for somebody else who's devoted their life to those questions. Those aren't the questions to which I've devoted my life. Um, and I try to avoid voicing my personal opinions whenever possible. Uh, I try to stick to the data and I have data that characterizes the brain. Um, all right. Can bacteria go through the blood-brain barrier? Very interesting topic. So, um, well, okay. So, so the blood-brain barrier, for anybody that's not familiar, is sort of like, it, well, it is exactly what it sounds like, right? Um, the brain requires a ton of blood delivery to feed our 86 billion neurons and, you know, at probably just as many glial cells, by the way. So if 86 billion sounds like a big number, double that. And we have at least that many cells in the brain. Um, neurons, which are the excitable brain cell, um, are some of the most metabolically active cells in um, the entire body. I mean, we're talking muscles, you know, cardiomyocytes, neurons are, are oftentimes more require, they, they are more active. They require more energy um, than, um, than, you know, other types of cells. Okay, so we have all this vasculature, all these veins and or all these ves uh, arteries delivering blood, veins uh, uh, draining it, that invade all through the brain. And there is a very important difference between the blood vessels in at the level of the central nervous system in the brain and the rest of the body. And that is that in the rest of the body, there are these tiny little gaps between the cells that compose blood vessels. Those gaps are called fenestrations. If you might vaguely recall fenestration, uh, there is a, a term called defenestration, which means literally throwing somebody outside of a window. And so those are the little windows between the cells that compose um, blood vessels. Um, and so there are none of those in the vast majority of the brain. Um, except there are a few places in the brain where there are fenestrations, and those, perhaps in, uh, uh, um, unsurprisingly, are kind of involved in monitoring the, the peripheral environment, monitoring your circulatory system for, for example, what concentrations of some foreign molecule might be. This is an area of the brain called the area postrema, uh, which, when a given foreign molecule, like an opioid, for example, um, gets high enough, it triggers a part of the area postrema called the chemoreceptor zone, which then causes involuntary, you can't stop it once it's triggered, vomit re reactions, right? Because if you think about the evolution, evolutionary context for that, that, somehow this molecule that's never in the body has reached concentrations that are way too high, get it out, right? Generally speaking, in the early evolutionary history of humans, there weren't really syringes around. And so the only way to get it in your body was by eating it. So, okay. So all that to say, it's extremely difficult for most things to get through the blood-brain barrier. It's one of the, the main challenges of drug development is trying to develop a molecule that is, that's capable of getting by, by the blood-brain barrier. There are some things, however, that can uh, access the brain. Um, and if you ever have a brain infection, that is a extremely life-threatening situation. Um, but you know, uh, uh, some bacteria, parasites, can uh, uh, gain access to the, to the brain despite the blood-brain barrier. In particular, you might have heard of, or if not, you should look into, Toxoplasma gondii. 
induces a, a condition called toxoplasmosis. And if you have any cats in your house, if you've lived with cats at any time in your life, you are very likely to have Toxoplasma gondii in your brain. <laughs> uh, it's pretty wild uh, how like, and, and okay, who cares, right? What is it doing? Well, in at least animal models that we've studied, it very significantly modifies their behavior. I'll give you one example, mice or rats that are infected with Toxoplasma gondii that have toxoplasmosis, while they would normally find the scent of cat urine completely aversive, one of the scariest things they ever smell, because of course, that's a predator. Um, and so avoiding predators is usually the best uh, uh, strategy for a little mammal like uh, a rat or a mouse. Toxoplasma gondii, when, when they're infected with it, they will tend to find the odor of cats appetitive. They will go towards the scent of urine. Humans that have been found to be infected with Toxoplasma gondii will tend to engage in rather risky behavior. Um, it's rather common in folks with schizophrenia. Um, and Toxoplasma gondii has its own tyrosine hydroxylase capabilities. Tyrosine hydroxylase is the what's called rate limiting step in the catalytic uh, uh, or the, the, let's say, biosynthesis of dopamine. Um, and so Toxoplasma gondii seems to be able to take tyrosine uh, and uh, uh, convert it into um, precursors for, for uh, dopamine. Um, so yeah, yeah. The, the world of pathogens and their relationship with the brain is a pretty freaky one. And for the long, the, okay, I, I've probably gone on, on, on this topic a little bit too long, but suffice it to say that we are in a stage of neuroscience where we are learning that the relationships between the immune system and the brain, which has been always conceived as being immunoprivileged, really no relationship with the immune system because of that blood-brain barrier. In fact, there are relationships between the central nervous system and the immune system, and those uh, there are manifold <laughs> relationships, um, and we are in a stage where we're collecting many, many new instances of these relationships. And so, for example, that is why you will see more studies where Inflammation, peripheral immune system signaling can influence things like mood, predisposition to psychiatric conditions, perhaps uh, the progression of neuro, uh, de uh, neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease or uh, Parkinson's disease or other forms of, of dementia. Um, and so, so yeah, interesting topic. I, I went way too long. Cerebellum, ask, answer my question. I don't know what your question is about the cerebellum. Um, so uh, it's tough for me to know. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I apologize if, if I missed it. Did you always love science when you were a boy? And how and when did you get interested in brain stuff? And that's a lovely question. Thank you very much. Um, I was always pretty interested in science. Uh, that interest was, I suspect, cultivated by my parents who were, have all, all, also always been interested in science. Um, particularly my mother drove that interest. Uh, at the dinner table, we would have conversations about evolution and uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, who, uh, who is particularly, particularly prolific at that time in, in my life. Um, but uh, I never thought I was good at science. I, I never knew, I've, I'd never met a, a bona fide scientist in my life. Um, and my sense of science was that you had to be a genius to do it. And I just didn't think that I would, had the stuff of a scientist. Um, and, but I was always interested in it. I was always interested in human behavior, but because I thought science was for other people who are much smarter than I am, um, I, I began college majoring in economics and uh, global politics. And um, in, at the end of sophomore year, on a whim, I took a course called Brain and Behavior. And I was, I, and I, at the time, I was extremely frustrated in my economics and politics classes because there wasn't any like, hard, like tangible data. It was just a lot of argumentation, which is fun. I love argumentation, but um, it just it felt like we were arguing opinions essentially. Um, and uh, in like, oh, this old guy wrote this concept about, you know, man, the state and war. And just because he's like old and well regarded, we have to believe him, you know, um, which is, you know, uh, it's a very um, uh, unsophisticated perspective of those of those uh, disciplines. But that was my reaction to them. Took brain and behavior. It was taught by somebody who has had initially pursued a Ph.D. in literature. And so as a result, he was extremely talented at communicating these rather dense um unsexy otherwise <laughs> topics and he seduced me into the dark arts of neuroscience and i sort of realized that like science is like, an, like any other discipline you know it's hard uh it demands a lot of your time 
you need to be passionate about it to sustain the motivation to stay in it. Um, but you don't need to be a, a brilliant genius to, to engage in science. You just need to be creative. Um, and and uh, that's, I think, a, a widely held misconception that um, scientists are, by definition, more intelligent than anybody else. No, it's just we, we tend to study things where we have the privilege of studying things that most people don't have the opportunity to ever even think about studying. Um, and so we know a lot about a thing that not a lot of people know about. And that, I think, uh, enables us to masquerade as far more intelligent than we are. Um, you know, take me outside of, of my primary interest zones and I am practically useless to you. Um, all right, science is, science is for religious people, even if religious folks aren't for science. Um, yeah, yeah, true fact. <laughs> You're as real as it gets. I'm petting my cat named Mrs. Oh, Ms. Schrodinger. Oh, that's very cute. <laughs> uh, yeah, 10 points to Gryffindor for anybody who understands that reference. Um, oh, somebody's calling in. Stop waxing on, Ian. Let's uh, chat with somebody. Okay, volume up. Very good. All right. Um, so we are just about to speak with somebody named... Uh, I'm sorry, what's your name and where are you calling from? Uh, this is Chris and I'm in San Francisco. Chris from San Francisco. Awesome. Uh, what's on your mind? Well, I've asked you before about uh, the rumor that certain foods are brain foods, and you gave me a great answer for that. So let me ask you the reverse question. I'll hang up to hear the answer. Are there certain foods that will dump you down? Yeah, no, <laughs> that's so super interesting topic. And I'm sure at, at, at the time I, I prefaced anything I said with nutritional science is one of the most frustrating sciences because it is one of the hardest sciences. Um, very difficult to conduct experiments that, that meaningfully reveal the, the realities of, of human nutrition. Human uh, uh, metabolism is extraordinarily diverse, genetically influenced, environmentally influenced. There's this whole effect of the microbiome, all the microbes <laughs> that inhabit our gut. So there's not a lot of hard and fast rules, essentially laws of nutrition that um, that you know we can rely too heavily on or be too in which we can be too confident. However, there have been um, what are called epidemiological studies, which are essentially studies that collect information from very large groups of people, statistical information, and then try and correlate that with uh, health outcomes. So, for example, one instance of these epidemiological studies is that people that consume diets that are um, particularly high in simple carbohydrates, in other words, sugar, they tend to uh, develop dementia more regularly or more frequently, and they tend to progress in dementia more rapidly. Um, so, uh, that you know, of of all the things that that you know may or may not be good for you, you know, there's there's a very contentious debate as to whether or not saturated fats are healthy or unhealthy. Um, you know, there's uh, some pretty good reasons to suspect that they're not as unhealthy as initially uh, described. Um, but you know that there's there are good faith disagreements at this point. Initially, they were not good faith disagreements. Uh, a lot of that emerged from sort of kind of pseudo corrupt relationships between different. Ent entities, but these days it is truly just a, a debate, and, and there are definitely data that correlate diets that are very, very high in saturated fats with negative health outcomes. Um, but uh, you know, like much of nutritional science, those data aren't what we would call extremely high quality. Doesn't mean that it's conducted by people of low quality. It's just that you know you can only control for so many things in nutritional science. Um, so, but the, the the one that I haven't heard anybody. Um, effectively defend is simple carbohydrates. Um, and um, a lot of, you know, the healthiest diets that are recommended for longevity, cognitive and, and longevity just in general, as well as, you know, longevity in, in cognitive health is the Mediterranean diet or the mind diet. These are essentially diets that basically minimize simple carbohydrates, oftentimes minimize carbohydrates just in general. Um, you know, uh, the ketogenic diet is receiving a lot of attention. Ketogenic diet is one wherein you essentially eliminate carbohydrates so that your body, uh, 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 um, uh, I was going to say revert, but it's not really revert. It prioritizes deriving ATP, deriving cellular energy from fats rather than carbohydrates, which would otherwise be its preferred source of caloric energy. Um, there's a lot of interest in ke the ketogenic diet. Um, I was going to do a podcast episode on it, in fact, um, and there's a lot of good reasons to suspect that it's actually a, a quite a healthy diet. Um, but uh, uh, but effective, almost all of these diets, Mediterranean, mind, ketogenic, 
uh, essentially revolve around minimizing carbohydrates and at the very least, simple carbohydrates. There's really no good reason to consume simple carbohydrates unless you're like a peak performance athlete, you know, then simple carbohydrates can be quite helpful to give you those, those intense, you know, to satisfy those intense demands of energy. Um, but for most of us, uh, mere peons in athleticism, uh, simple carbohydrates are just not necessary. Um, all right. Um, uh, love hearing baby. Wow. You, <laughs> if I had a microphone playing uh, for longer, you would hear her quite a bit. She's extremely vocal, very opinionated little baby. <laughs> Uh, she is the best. She is so adorable. She's sick right now, though. She caught she caught a bug of some sort. Her nose is just, you know, dripping with a vengeance. Olfactory receptors. Does the number that a person has vary by cultures or in the blind, for example? Super interesting topic. Um, okay, so so everybody's on the same page. Olfactory receptors. Olfaction is the 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 unified sense of smell and taste. Without olfaction, you would not be able to smell nor taste anything. There are some you know, phylogenetic arguments or evolutionary arguments that um, olfaction, which is at its core um, chemoreception, right, where a chemical structure is binding a receptor, uh, there are arguments that it is the oldest of all sensory systems, right, that it predates, it, it's, a, its emergence on Earth predates, you know, vision, certainly, um, you know, auditory processing, even, even you know, tactile processing or the, or the precursors to, to tactile processing. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, and as a result, in the human brain, it has a very, well, a, a rather unique um, neural architecture. It, it, the, the, the neurophysiology associated with, with smell and taste projects in unique ways compared to other sensory systems. For example, it sends direct projections to limbic structures, which regulate emotional processing and motivation. Um, okay, so olfactory receptors are the sort of the the kind of the bare minimum of the olfactory system. It's not you know without without olfactory receptors we would not we could have an olfactory cortex, we could have an olfactory bulb, <laughs> we could have um, you know all the rest of, the, of of the physiology. But without the receptors, there is no transduction. There is no conversion of the presence of a molecule to uh, a change in, in sensory perception, and Different animals have different numbers of olfactory receptors. I, of course, am forgetting the number that humans have, but you know we're, we're pretty good at smelling stuff, right? You, you can tell when somebody's farted, for example. You can tell when somebody, I can certainly tell when somebody's cooking lobster. Um, but the number of olfactory receptors uh, in the, the human um, uh, olfactory bulb is paltry relative to dogs, for example, who have tremendously more olfactory receptors, which enables them to not only have a more sensitive sense of smell, but that enables them to distinguish more nuances. Like if you can imagine when it comes to vision, we have essentially three cone receptors, three receptors that are sensitive to color. Those colors are red, green, and blue, RGB. Um, and in some women, by the way, they're called tetrachromats. They have an extra red uh, cone for, for you know, slightly different um, nuanced uh, uh, red perception. If you can imagine having, you know, so that's all we have, and it's pretty effective. Human vision is pretty remarkable. It's very messy, but it's pretty remarkable. If you can imagine expanding, oh, and, and so those cones co uh, uh, correspond to different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? The electromagnetic spectrum is the spectrum of waves, essentially, that, you know, is composed of X-rays, microwaves, gamma rays, uh, and, and so on. And there's a little sliver of it called the visual spectrum. And th that is the wavelengths of photons uh, or of radiation that are able to stimulate our photoreceptors. And so we have a cone that's sensitive to a certain wavelength of, uh, of the, the spectrum and then uh, another cone, let's say a green, that's sort of sensitive to another. That, so if you can imagine, we just proliferate. We expand the number of cones on the eye and we vary the, the spectrum to which they are sensitive, we would be capable of seeing quite a, a, a larger visual reality, right? One could imagine having a, a receptor that's sensitive to x-rays, in which case you could see what you, uh, at least some of what you see when you get an x-ray, because x-rays are able to penetrate tissue in different ways. Um, and same goes for, for other areas of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, so. That's like comparing dogs to, to humans. Now, I do recall, 
Oh, and, and the process of generating. So we generate olfactory receptors all the time. That is, by the way, how we become accustomed and desensitized to a given smell. You might go to a foreign country and, you know, whatever, there's a bunch of a different spice that's very prevalent in cooking or, you know, uh, 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 the use of perfume in cologne is, is just different. You know, they maybe just don't use it at all. Whatever, you're exposed to a whole monsoon of new smells. That's why to them, it's like it's not it's totally normal. They've become desensitized to it. The number of olfactory receptors to which that, that those sen the, those scents bind has changed for them. And if you're there for long enough, yours will, too. Um, so and, and yeah, the, the genetic process is very interesting. But um, I do recall seeing uh, uh, that there is some genetic uh, predictor of like olfactory sensitivity for example, the um, ability of some people, um, you know, the likelihood that somebody finds cilantro delicious or coriander, as it's called outside of the United States, basically, um, coriander uh, or, or cilantro. Some people, I find it absolutely delicious. I basically, you can put it on anything and I'll be happy. Other people have like political campaigns to ban cilantro. Um, that is genetically predictable. Um, there are also people who find, um, oh, what is it? I think it's lettuce. There's a certain molecule in some plant that for some people tastes like normal, you know, or does they don't taste it at all. And for other people, it is profoundly bitter um, and, and absolutely repulsive. And that is genetically determined. Um, now, I, when it comes to the number of olfactory receptors, I, I have not ever seen any genetic analysis of whether or not some people have tremendously greater number of olfactory receptors. Um, but I think it would, I, I think I understand what you're wondering here, which is, um, you know, are some people genetically superior to others in their sense of smell or in their sense of taste, uh, akin to the way that dogs are superior to humans in their sense of smell? Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that olfactory receptors are not the sole substrate, the physical stuff that processes scent of smell and and and, um, and and taste. There is also neuronal cortical processing that occurs to to decipher the stimulation of those photoreceptors and there can be definitely genetic variability there as well so um so yeah so definitely genes can determine how you respond to certain olfact uh, olfactory stimuli i don't know about the number of olfactory receptors i don't see why not but um i can't tell you for sure ian does farting help prevent dementia i've never seen any randomized uh double blind controlled uh, uh trials clinical trials on, on the relationship between farting and, uh, and dementia. I'm sorry to say. I'm shocked to say. Um, all right. I can only write in capital letters after being hit with a golf ball. Is that... That's interesting. Um, I, if that's the only um, uh, ramification of being struck in the head, then um, I, that's not so bad, I suppose. But uh, that, that is a fairly specific alteration of, um, of language processing. That's, that's interesting. I'm glad to hear you're doing okay, though. Um, yeah, like kale and Brussels sprouts, exactly. Why my hairs went away? Is it my brain? No, your brain does not, is not the principal mechanism by which people go bald. Um, it is involved, however, because the reason people go bald, some people go bald, um, I will likely go bald, is it, the way that certain receptors, androgen receptors on the scalp, essentially, by it, near hair follicles, respond to a byproduct of testosterone, the hormone, its metabolism into DHT, another uh, a sort of, uh, not really a metabolite, just a, a converted molecule derived from testosterone. Um, and uh, some people respond, some people's hair follicles respond, you know, they, they, they don't respond at all really with, with hair thinning or hair loss, uh, but some people it, you know, basically stops the growth cycle of, of a hair follicle. So your brain certainly influences testosterone production, but it is not, you know, the testicles are where uh, testosterone is primarily produced. Um, and, you know, central nervous system activity definitely influences uh, testosterone production, like, you know, how stressed you are, um, uh, you know, endocrine regulation by, like, the hypothalamus and pituitary and so on, but that's it's not the, the seat of power that's controlling your rate of balding, unfortunately. Um, all right, can we see her someday? You know, um, that was something that my wife and I debated quite a bit. Um, and we came to the conclusion that uh, we're really only sharing pictures of the baby with family members directly. We're not even putting them on, on Facebook. 
Uh, just because I think that, you know, it might just, it might be the case that my generation, but perhaps her generation might have, might be the last that actually has a choice as to whether or not they want to remain anonymous or can decide how much of their lives they want to share. And so, you know, while we're taking way too many pictures of her, obviously, as I think all parents do, um, we're, we're just keeping them private. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to make that decision for her. Um, if you know what I mean. So um, in the interest of, pre of protecting her privacy or her right to privacy, uh, I'm, I'm keeping her as, as private as, as I can. Um, all right. Um, she sounds so cute. She is very adorable. Um, I know, and I, I apologize for doing that to you because I assure you, you're missing out. She's very, very cute. My body has always had extreme levels of estrogen. Oh, that's interesting. Um, it's good to see you, by the way. Uh, Okay, I ran a double-blind controlled, double-blind study involving farts in my brother's face when I was younger. Oh yeah, how did he respond? Does he love you? <laughs> what effect on pair bonding did I have? Um, all right. Oh, there's going, yeah. Hey, Ian, oh, hope you're doing well. Speaking of olfactory, I read about a person receiving smells without bulbs. Oh, that's interesting, Exibus. Good to see you, by the way. Um, I would be interested in seeing that study um, because I would imagine that if, if it was digested in by popular science that s there was some remnant of uh, uh, chemoreception by olfactory uh, proteins but hey you know I never I've never seen that study um, like for example there was a study where um, uh, or a, a case where somebody had had severe hydrocephalus and essentially lost in in you know popular science they said he basically didn't have a brain. But the reality was he had a thin layer of cortex, um, you know, much thinner than, than normal. And it is shockingly remarkable that he was able to survive. Don't get me wrong, but he still did have brain. Right. And so so it's just inaccurate to suggest that, oh, you don't need it. Right. Um, but uh, but it is interesting. All right. Uh, this looks risky, my friends. This could be a troll. Um, there's a lot of emojis in this guy's name. So uh, what's your name and where are you calling from? We lost him. Hold on. Hold on. I got it. Okay, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Can you hear me good? Okay. I got the Bluetooth earbuds. Um, I have MS, and I was wondering a, a problem I've been dealing with ever since I had MS, and it's I go into sweat fits. It's not really a hot flash. It's a, just uncontrollably sweat. I had to buy a cooling vest and, and everything just to settle it down. And it's usually when I get a, a little nervous, um, have to rush somebody or, or somewhere like that. But it won't stop unless it wants to. You know, it, it won't help standing up for other air, air condition or anything like that. And I was wondering what part of the brain... Mm -hmm. I was told uh, hype or something or another, it, it does that. And I didn't know if there was some kind of medicine I could take to control this because it's really affecting everything I do. Everywhere I go, go I have to take an ice pack, you know, with me. And it's just getting old. Yeah. And the opportunity to see if you would know anything about that. I don't, uh, the doctor I know didn't really know much about it. She said hype or something or another. Um, meeting when you get nervous or something it sets it off um so that's interesting so just do me a favor i, I just i like to keep track of this um where where what's your name and where are you calling from uh derek okay florida oh cool okay perfect thank you very much derek um so that's interesting now um i i'm sorry to hear that uh, by the way um while i am I'm fortunate to, to not have um, ms i am a sweater I, and I got this from my dad, inherited from my dad. If, if, I, if I am not like very rigidly controlling my, my, the temperature in my environment, I'm just sweaty like a pig. It's the worst. And I'm always too hot too. Um, and so, um, so yeah. I, can, I can empathize uh, to, to an extent. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, we just moved here two years ago and I did it in Illinois also. And so it wasn't the Florida temperature. It was dead winter. I would do the same thing, you know? Yeah. Um, so, well, so, so there, there is certain, there, there is a, a condition or, you know, it's, it's not, you know, it's very loosely described as a condition because it's obviously not life-threatening. Um, ah, and I'm forgetting it. It's like hyper, um, 
Oh gosh, I'm. You know, I, I haven't looked this up in so long, but there is a, a recognized condition where um, sweat glands are hyperactive. Um, now, uh, and but it, it you don't necessarily have to be super hot to um, to for them to be hyperactive. Um, there, there's also hyperthyroid, um, where um, hyperhidrosis. Thank you so much, Marcus. Yes, hyperhidrosis, um, where. Um, I'm sorry, say that again. You're, you're a little muffled. That's not the like what the doctor, my primary, said. Yeah. Um, she told me to ask my neurologist, but I don't see her for another month. So I just took the opportunity to pick your well, brain. So, so that there is a little bit more we can talk about. So, um, so hyperhidrosis is one thing. There's also hyperthyroid, um, where uh, it's a it's completely different mechanism, but people who have too much circulating um, thyroid hormone will oftentimes get excessively sweaty, and they're much more easily excitable and they're very um, energetic and, and sort of stressed more regularly. Um, regardless, if it is just hyperhidrosis, um, then there's actually, you might've heard of Botox. Um, so Botox is, you know, it's a cosmetic thing mostly uh, that's used to, what's that say? Say that again? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so actually it has been shown to be pretty effective for some people with migraines, but, um, uh, you, if you get injections of Botox into certain sweat glands, like I know a lot of celebrities actually get it in their armpit, believe it or not, um, they it'll stop, it'll prevent you from being able to sweat for you know an extended period of time. Oh no no, it, it wouldn't do that. I'm, I'm not I'm not even recommending you do this, but um, you know it right. that that is just one alternative. Uh, if if it's really affecting your quality of life, there are also other there are medications that you can take well, to alter right. the your sweating. Um, but generally speaking, it's not recommended unless um, you know in, in in most cases. Right. She, she recommended at first that the only thing she knows what would control the sweating and, and body temperature would be like uh, antidepressant SSRIs Ooh, okay. and Xanax, uh, which I am both on. I'm on both of those. Wait, what was the second and one? Xanax. Uh, oh, Xanax. Okay. Cool we, and uh, SSRIs, which I do take effects her. And okay. she said that is known to cool your body off. And that's all she knows about what medication to take is SSRIs. She said I'm taking pretty much everything that would do it. Yeah, I but, mean, so so that 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 is a completely different mechanism. So so those, an SSRI and a Xanax, which is alprazolam, which is called a benzodiazepine, um, right. those are attacking this you know issue from the perspective of psychiatry. Um, so the the concept there would be that because you're for whatever reason prone to becoming a, you know anxious. By the way, you can just develop anxiety because you are anticipating that you're going to start sweating. Um, and so that will minimize the sweat attacks happen as simple as my wife would text me more than three times and I wake up from a nap I panic like something's wrong I see, Boom. I see. I'm in a, something like that I see well then you, that, that makes a lot of sense to me and you know I'm certainly not going to uh, comment on whether or not you know what I feel about your your doctor's prescribing decisions I would absolutely put uh, you know have conversations with your physician and um, I would rely on that um, I but that does make sense. I mean, that sounds like a panic attack. Yeah, it's a it's a minor one, but since I have MS, it's just so bad. And and I just didn't know if you knew a trick um, in your experience, if you've heard of it before, things like that. No, listen, man. That's okay. Yeah, Derek, I, 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 I wish I had something bad. better for you. And I tell you what, if I did, then I would also be doing that method. I just, I have fans no. all over the place. <laughs> so that's my strategy. <laughs> Amazon and get yourself an ice vest. And, and oh, I have. Yeah. You put I have that. And yeah. I wear the ice vest. And uh, that works great. But well, I don't want to wear the Bush Gardens or anywhere like that. So. Yeah, exactly. You know. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, Derek, thanks for calling in, man. And best of luck. And let me know if, if you do come to some kind of effective treatment, please let me know what it is. <laughs> All right. I've meditated a lot. So I'm hopefully um, in when one of my trans meditations, I'm going to be able to solve this somehow. Um, Neil Bland or something, you know. What I mean? <laughs> well, good luck, man. Uh, it was great talking to you. Thanks for calling in. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, and I, I don't know that there would be any relationship with, with multiple sclerosis, but of course, the diagnosis with MS complicates what kind of medications you might be, um, you know, considering. Um, so Abyss, I saw that you said that, that Botox um, uh, essentially prevents the snare complex from operating. You are absolutely right. In fact, that was a pop quiz question that I put on one of my quizzes for my uh, uh, intro neuroscience students in my recitation. Um, but because sweating is regulated by cholinergic activity, and uh, we're specifically talking about the snare complex that enables the release of acetylcholine, it prevents activation of some, you know, whatever pathway is, uh, you know, regulates uh, activation of sweat glands. So um, just like, you know, acetylcholine is binding nicotinic acetylcholine receptors at the neuromuscular junctions every single time you move any muscle, every time your heart beats, every time you raise your eyebrow like that, um, same thing goes for, for sweating, uh, uh, you know, and that's why Botox both paralyzes muscles and also um, uh, can prevent sweating. Pretty crazy, right? Um, all right. Ian, do you have panic attacks too? You know, um, next juice, uh, interesting topic. Um, I don't know if I've ever had a pa panic attack. Um, I, and I think, you know, my, if, if I were telling that to myself, I would suggest you, then you probably haven't, right? Because they're, they're pretty uh, abundantly obvious when they're happening. Um, but I, I am certainly prone to anxiety. Um, and um, and there is a, there's a difference there. Um, you know, the difference between fear and anxiety is very interesting. I just basically wrote a chapter of my dissertation on it. Um, and it's been, um, you know, a distinction that has kind of vexed scientists for, for many decades now, uh, arguably centuries. Um, but uh, but uh, I've, cert I've probably had something like an anxiety attack, um, if not just an, an outright anxiety attack, um, in the few days up, uh, um, prior to my dissertation defense, which went very well. Um, but I just, I inherited this predisposition to anxiety. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I just, I sort of like, it, it was, it was probably the most intense experience of anxiety I've ever had in my life. Um, but, uh, but I, I can't say for sure that it, that it would be recognized by a more trained, you know, psychiatrist or clinician as, as an attack. Um, okay. When neurology checks, see, if they see a white spot on her brain from the injury. Well, certainly if he's diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, they've already done some neuroimaging. I mean, I, I would imagine. Um, all right. Oh, thank you for the super hearts, guys. Oh, thank you very much, Joy, for the super hearts. And um, thank you uh, to LL79. Um, I really appreciate it. That's very generous of you guys. Um, all right. Oh, right. Uh, does that affect sensitivity to capsaicin? And uh, trip V1 receptors laced with Botox. You know, that's interesting. I don't know. Um, uh, I doubt it. I doubt it. Uh, because that is a, that's a pharmacological, you know, uh, interaction. And unless those trip V1 channels are only on cholinergic neurons, I don't see any reason for why that would prevent the, the signal transduction. Uh, could be poth. I mean, it, it, maybe, it, maybe, maybe they are only cholinergic neurons, but I would imagine that they're not. Uh, well, I would imagine if they are cholinergic, they're probably co-releasing glutamate, um, uh, and uh, so yeah, that that. But I'm I'm speculating there. Trip V1 channels are very interesting. They're, they're sort of like the proto dread chemogenetics. Um, all right, can you uh, net, can you talk about the effect of exercise and movement versus being sedentary on the brain? It's a very interesting topic. Um, Okay, so obviously th this is a giant topic. Um, so let's um, focus on some of the studies into the effects of um, exercise and, and engaging in movement, cardiovascular activity, uh, uh, the effects of that on longevity. So for the longest time, and it, it was sort of perplexing because um, it, it's so counterintuitive, but for the longest time, there was really not a lot of evidence to suggest that engaging in, in exercise you know, yielded any real benefits in the development of Alzheimer's disease or dementia. It was super weird. Like, you know, in one instance, would you ever suggest that exercise isn't good for you, <laughs> right? And so, you know, physicians would recommend, yeah, do it anyways. We can't tell you that it's going to prevent your dementia, but you should do it anyways. But since then, and th this was only a couple years ago, since then, um, some really massive meta reviews have been done that actually did detect a beneficial effect of cardiovascular activity on uh, on the you know uh, predispositions to, to dementia and the 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 rate of um, of its progression, um, and 
it was specifically cardiovascular activity, not like resistance training, although resistance training is definitely beneficial for other reasons. Um, uh, but yeah, and I think they recommended, they, they essentially found that the, the, the government recommended, you know, the NIH recommended a frequency of cardiovascular exercise for people over the age of 65, basically predicted for the best cognitive outcomes with regards to um, dementia. So, um, you know, it was something in the ballpark of like, you know, 20 minutes of moderate intensity cardiovascular exercise three times a week, something like that. Um, so, so yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's awesome. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for asking next juice. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, okay. Uh, it can give me heat sensitivity. Good, forgive me. Um, you're a doctor. I'm a PhD candidate. I'm, I'm, I'm basically, um, I'm in like the last phase of my, of my, the, uh, my PhD. It's the PhD, my PhD. Um, I basically added, um, I defended many months ago at this point, but I, I added a couple sections to my dissertation to make it a more compelling read, a more substantive document. Uh, okay. What is oxytocin? Oh no, oxycontin. Uh, it's, it's oxycontin, uh, but oxycontin with a breakthrough of oxycodone due to the brain when prescribed over 12 years. Okay, so um, I so what I suspect you're you're referring to is oxycodone, it, which is the active ingredient in oxycontin, um, is being prescribed for the management of pain, chronic pain, with the availability of breakthrough of of higher doses for the treatment of breakthrough pain, basically pain that penetrates your sort of your foundation of analgesia of, of your pain management. Um, and so, um, you know, different doses of oxycodone are used for different reasons. In pain management, oftentimes those doses can get pretty high because it turns out, unfortunately, opioids, even potent opioids like oxycodone are actually not that effective at actually treating chronic pain. That said, we don't have a lot of good treatments for chronic pain, and opioids at least improve quality of life and do mitigate the severity of pain to some degree. Um, but so as a result, oftentimes people have to escalate their doses to, you know, a regular doses um, that, you know, the, 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 um, the amount of which would potentially uh, kill somebody, <laughs> somebody who doesn't, doesn't have a tolerance. And this is, of course, due to the development of tolerance, which in response to opioids, occurs fairly rapidly. And by the way, I actually studied the pathway in the brain that has the densest collection of the receptors, the neurotransmitter receptors, to which oxycodone, heroin, morphine, fentanyl bind. The den the, If you look all throughout the entire nervous system and you look for where the densest collection of those receptors are, they're, where I, they're in the part of the brain that I study. And that's part of the reason I study it. Um, but, okay, so... Okay, so, so opioids are at this point fairly notorious for their addictive propensity or, or their propensity to induce addiction. They are among the most addictive drugs that one can do. They're extremely euphoric for some people. They're actually dysphoric for some people. Um, those folks seem to, seem to be genetically protected against the addictive properties of opioids because when they take an opioid, it's not pleasure. It's not pleasurable. It's not pleasant. It's not rewarding. They feel sick and dizzy and they, they feel cognitively sluggish. Whereas other people, and I believe I'm in this camp, when they take opioids, they feel great. They feel energy. They feel euphoric. They feel creative. And they're just like, oh, I know I just got my tonsils out and my wisdom teeth out, but I want to go, go to work. I want, I'm you know feeling great. <laughs> uh, and so that is a very uh, uh, substantial difference in pharmacogenomic reactions to the same drug. Okay. So it's highly addictive, as you know. It, it's extremely, the addiction to opioids is um, the addiction for which treatment is the least effective and for which we have the fewest effective treatments. Um, we, however, unlike many other addictions, um, no, actually, unlike some addictions, we do have some options like, for example, methadone treatment or um, suboxone treatment, right? This is uh, essentially maintenance therapies. Um, okay, so, um, so it's, it, they're severely addictive. However, unlike alcohol or many stimulants, um, opioids are pretty benign to the nervous system. Opioids, despite the fact that one can overdose on them, uh, you know, particularly very, very potent opioids like fentanyl, but also oxycodone, particularly when combined with other uh, uh, drugs like benzodiazepines or alcohol, 
um, you know, one can overdose. Um, but if somebody is living in that therapeutic zone, the therapeutic window where they're, you know, they're not taking massive doses, they're not, you know, using it recreationally necessarily, um, their nervous system will not be damaged. Um, so the long-term effects of regular opioid use is addiction um, and, and, you know, substance dependence. Um, and uh, so, so that, that, you know, and, and it is, it's, it's a non-trivial dependence, you know, it's not like caffeine addiction, right? Um, so, uh, so, yeah, and, and that's why there is intense interest in, um, into the development of alternatives for the management of pain. Um, codone is for breakthrough pain, Cot cotin, co so oxycontin is sustained uh, for long term in the body. I'm not quite sure what you're suggesting there. Um, oxycodone is what's in oxycontin, right? Oxycontin is oxycodone. Um, codeine is a different opioid. It's far less potent than oxycodone. And, um, and morphine is also different. In fact, morphine and oxycodone, excuse me, are derived from different molecules that are, that are in the opium poppy. Uh, you know, morphine is just present as morphine in uh, the opium poppy, whereas oxycodone is actually converted from thebane, different alkaloid. Um, all right, did I see your methadone question? I did not, I'm sorry. Um, let's see if I can catch it. Is methadone worth it to treat bone pain in low doses? Well, I, I mean, I, I am not in a position to make that calculation for anybody else. Um, and I know that there happens to be pretty substantial disagreement among clinicians um, as to the utility of methadone um, and, you know, it, it's, it's sort of benefits and it's disadvantages. Um, the tricky thing about methadone is that uh, while it has this very extended effect, right, so I, part of the reason for why it's used for the treatment of opioid addiction is that it gives you a much more stable and predictable stimulation of those same receptors that are be, that were being stimulated by like heroin or oxycodone that's that's one of the reasons that it's used um but it, it doesn't it's not as effective that's the pharmacological term it doesn't stimulate the receptors as much as op, you know other opioids um but because of the way that methadone interacts with, with mu opioid receptors which are the receptors to which it binds um sorry <laughs> uh the addiction to or, or the dependence upon methadone is rather severe um it's like unusually quite difficult to stop methadone compared to even other opioids um now if somebody has chronic pain you know the calculation could be i don't care i mean i'm planning on taking it for the rest of my life anyways so whatever you know I, i'd rather have high quality of life and i i'm rather sympathetic to that argument um but uh but you know that is that is the the calculation that a physician and a patient together will make um, you know, cause it is a very significant decision to make. Um, but, but it is, you know, it can be effective for sure. Um, there are non-narcotics you can take that helps just, just the same. Um, well, th there's really nothing that can, um, deliver the effect of an opioid, right? I mean, there's a reason for that, you know, like these, these molecules are like, like supernaturally stimulating receptors that are normally bound by by chemicals that are produced in the body, by endorphins and enkephalins. Um, and so, you know, the, there's, a, there's a reason that they're so addictive, and that, that is that no natural stimulus can, can induce that same effect. Um, now, I, I would agree with you if you're arguing that there are other means of addressing chronic pain, you know, uh, 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 physical therapy. Um, oftentimes, there can be a, a rather severe psychiatric component to chronic pain. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not saying that like opioids are the king of all medicines <laughs> or the queen of all medicines, but, um, but you know, when it comes to like, tr you know, like I, you know, I, and I don't, I don't even know if this is what you're arguing, but people oftentimes make the argument that like you can achieve the same altered states of consciousness that drugs induce by doing other things. And it's just like from the perspective of neuropharmacology and neuroscience, that's like a, a ludicrous statement to make. It doesn't mean that drugs are better than any natural means, but it, there's no reason that you have to trivialize the natural, you know, means of altering one's states of consciousness by comparing them to drugs and vice versa, right? They're just different. doesn't mean one is better than the other. Um, and, you know, when somebody's in, experiencing severe chronic pain, it can be the thing that, that determines their ability to live independently. Um, all right. 
five weeks ago I had a hemorrhagic stroke right side. How long does after stroke fatigue last? Um, so Ronnie, first of all, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, so um, for, anybody, for anybody that's not familiar, um, there are essentially two kinds of stroke that people will tend to have. Um, one is um, where essentially a, blo a, a blood delivery vessel becomes um, uh, obstructed and blood cannot flow. And another is the other is the uh, hemorrhagic stroke. And that is where there's essentially bleeding within the brain. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they both essentially, the reason we call them both strokes is they both end up delivering the same consequence, which is a deprivation of blood delivery to various parts of the brain. And depending upon where in the brain that that has occurred, that blockage or that bleeding has occurred, you, uh, uh, depending on what those brain regions do, you can have different symptoms. Um, and, uh, you know, oftentimes because there are certain blood vessels that are particularly critical for the delivery of blood, um, oftentimes they tend to be, you know, associated with motoric control, one's ability to move various muscles. Uh, but, you know, oftentimes also can include um, language, you know, disrupted language processing, um, either because one loses the ability to move the muscles of the generate, you know, that generate speech, or it can be cognitive um, uh, disruption where the parts of the brain that uh, process language are, are, are damaged. And there are other things too, right? Mood can be, can, can become uh, disrupted. Um, and one of the sort of classic um, sort of general symptoms, regardless of, of where the stroke has occurred, is this fatigue that, um, you know, I, f from what I understand, uh, post-stroke fatigue can last for a, um, a range of time. It's usually a couple weeks. Um, and that, unfortunately, can make the, the uh, physical therapy that often is prescribed after a stroke really difficult because, you know, not only is it actually just neurophysiologically difficult to move those muscles to literally send the signals to the muscle but you also are just exhausted you know it's just um and so you know it, it's it's a it's a tragic demonstration of the relationships between motivation to move and capacity to move um and so uh but but i you know i don't know that there is a, a hard and fast rule about how long you know post-stroke fatigue will last um, but, but my, my anticipation would be that it is, uh, it ranges, uh, depending upon the severity of the stroke. Um, good luck with your recovery. Um, stroke is, is, um, so somebody very close to me, uh, had a stroke, um, a while ago now. And, you know, of course I studied stroke, the biology of stroke, um, in, you know, graduate school and in college, you know, when you study neuroscience, you learn about strokes. Um, but from when you're, you know, taking on the role of a scientist, you're just understanding the, the underlying biology of a stroke and what you don't come to learn. And what I came to learn in a, um, a sort of horrifying way is how, um, how much more progress there is to be made on the quality of treatments for stroke. Um, it, it's sort of remarkable to me that we haven't come further uh, in, in how we uh, address um, such a, a very common affliction. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I just, I had no idea. Um, I, I sort of assumed that we had, you know, you, you hear about like the clot buster drug, which is actually not as effective as, as it's described as being like the clot buster. Yeah. You know, like bust those clots, <laughs> but, uh, it's actually not that effective at doing that. Um, it's interesting biology in, in the way it works. Um, but, um, anyways, uh, regardless, uh, best of luck with your, uh, recovery, um, it's great. It, it's clearly your, your language capacity is intact. Um, you're, you're quite intelligible in your ability to write, Ronnie. And, um, and I would imagine that that correlates with um, uh, an intact cognition. So, so that is a great sign. Great sign. Um, okay. Blood thinners. Yeah, essentially, you know, blood thinners are oftentimes prescribed after somebody has a stroke. Um, all right. Yes, it is very poor quality. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, it's depressing. Well, what is it, the, the post-it notes on the wall all about? Um, I guess you haven't seen my the status of my garden recently, have you? Um, so those post-it notes were, um, actually, so those, those post-it notes, this whiteboard, I also have post-it notes over there. Um, because I was writing this new section, which I, I can't remember how long the section was, probably in the ballpark of like 60 pages, um, 
and essentially every sentence of those of those pages is derived from some piece of research that has been performed in the past in some cases in the very distant past um where like they were literally like stimulating different parts of the brain and seeing what happened to people totally wild like you could never do that i mean you can do that but it's very seldomly done um this was like they were essentially st stimulating a part of the brain called the periaqueductal gray and like okay well, what's happening how do you feel and people would engage in like defensive behaviors <laughs> and they would also say i'm experiencing the most severe dread i've ever experienced <laughs> which is like oh that's interesting let's move over to the side <laughs> what's happening now um anyway so like every sentence is cited right it's it's derived from some finding in the past and just keeping all of those concepts top of mind is essentially impossible at least for me and so i need like a physical manifestation of those thoughts of those ideas and and then just reminders of like okay i'm going to move on to this next section but don't forget to modify this this and this in this section and when you're moving in through this section remember that oh there was that periaqueductal gray study that is probably going to be relevant as i move into the next section so that's why and uh and because i'm i wasn't done with the dissertation completely uh until rather recently um that's why they're still there and it is also just kind of interesting to me. Oh, actually, those were for my defense. Don't forget, you know, various topics for my defense. And these are for my uh, uh, dissertation. Um, and it's just kind of interesting to me now. It's sort of like an artifact of the um, the most stressful experience of my life. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, what can I tell you about anxiety? Oh, man. Well, I can tell you a lot. So my, my thesis research was on a very evolutionarily ancient part of the brain, been on the planet in some animal or another for at least 350 million years. How do we know that? It's because we see it in fish. Fish are rather distantly related evolutionarily to humans, much more distantly than other mammals. They, the other primates, chimpanzees, bonobos, rhesus macaques, even gorillas, they have this pathway in the brain. Okay, that's our closest relatives. Other mammals, right? Dogs, cats, rats, mice, they have it. They have that same pathway. Okay, so, you know, rodents are, are, are more distantly related. Uh, but then we can go even further and further and further, and we can go all the way to fish when, when, you know, the kingdom of Animalia had yet to crawl from the depths of the primordial ooze from which we all descend. Um, even fish have this pathway. So that's how we know that it's been around for a very long time. And usually when it comes to, to, to biology, if something has been in the body for a very long time, it's a very important part of the body because over the course of evolution, if it wasn't important, it very likely would have been modified and altered and perhaps even removed if it wasn't important. And uh, But what probably what happens when it's sufficiently screwed up is that an animal finds it very difficult to survive. Okay, uh, and we have good reason to believe that it's involved in regulating anxiety. Been around for a long time. That's, that's the topic of my dissertation. Um, here's an interesting thing about anxiety that until my, my um, descent into this body of literature devoted to understanding the ethology of anxiety, in other words, how we understand human anxiety by observing animal behavior, after all, we are genetically related to other animals. Um, what was interesting to me was this, and this is called the deacon Greif uh, hypothesis of um, anxiety and serotonin. Actually, we'll step back. There was this, this um, couple, this uh, couple, uh, the Blanchards, B-L-A-N-C-H-A-R-D-S, because there's two of them, the Blanchards, and they composed one of the, I think, most interesting models of anxiety. And they, it's, it's not just anxiety, but I think it's the most interesting uh, um, articulation of it, which is it puts it in comparison to fear. Anxiety, so fear is what we feel in the moment when there is a threatening stimulus that's a threat to our survival, when we're in the presence of an axe murder with a machete. Anxiety, however, is the anticipation that there may be some threat in the very near future. And we, that's a learned capacity. Um, but what's interesting and one of their insights that I, I never really thought of it this way. So fear, the experience of fear, motivates an animal to withdraw 
from a stimulus to evade, to, to engage in fight or flight, right? Um, anxiety, however, actually motivates an organism to um, engage the potential perceived threat, to engage in exploratory behavior until there's sufficient fear to drive an animal back away once again, or to, for the first time, right? Um, it's kind of an interesting way to think about anxiety, It's because I, I don't think we think of it this way naturally, intuitively, at least I don't. Um, so fear uh, motivates you to remove yourself from a scenario. Anxiety motivates you to explore a scenario for the possibility of it being a fearful um, stimulus, a fearful um, part of your environment. Um, all right. Um, let's see. You know what? I should probably call it a night. Uh, I got to go pick up some stuff for the baby. Got to get some, uh, some tissues because she's so sick. Um, all right. I have a podcast. It's called Wired to be Weird. It's on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and so on. Um, I haven't updated it in a while, and it's because of this dissertation descent into madness uh, that I've uh, only recently clawed my way out of. Um, but I will be updating it uh, in the not-too-distant future. I have a YouTube channel, um, and I, I pr it's, it includes these live streams, but I preface it every time with a short discussion of an, a given topic. I've talked about e-cigarettes and health. Today, I talked about whether or not there's a relationship between video game playing and increased violent behavior. Uh, you can pr I, I don't know exactly how you can find my YouTube channel, which is kind of ridiculous, but I think if you just type in Ian McLaughlin brain or you know Ian uh, anthropoid brain, you'll be able to find me. Otherwise, um, it was wonderful to get to talk to you once again after all this time, refreshing, invigorating. Um, and uh, if I don't see you later on this week, have a wonderful week, and uh, I hope to see you same time, same place next Sunday. See you there. Have a great week, effort. <laughs> Have a great week, everybody. See you guys. And YouTube, adios, sayonara, sai chan. See you guys. <laughs>